The room was poorly lit, and it took a moment for my eyes to adjust to the light of the solitary lamp that sat on the scarred wooden table in front of me. The room smelled of salt and musty old books, and I found it oddly comforting, reminiscent of my time spent aboard the sea vessels. I moved slowly into the creaky chair and took a deep breath, preparing myself to begin my story. I'm Miss Scarlet, I said slowly and deliberately, but that's not the name I was born with. It's the name I took when I decided to leave my old life behind. I rested my hands on my lap and regarded the group before me. I could see the curiosity and even a bit of skepticism in their faces, but they all sat silently and eagerly awaited my next words. Classified Deep Sea Exploration. That's what I did for years. Not the glossy documentary-style stuff, and not the scientific explorations that National Geographic covers. This was different, this was classified, and only a handful of people in the government and military even knew about it. I leaned in a little closer, resting my elbows on the table. You're all familiar with the Bermuda Triangle, I assume? All the strange disappearances, the bizarre occurrences. It's quite the mystery, wouldn't you agree? I received a few muted nods in response. But it's also a handy distraction, I went on, trying to keep the smile from my face. If everyone's attention is on that stretch of sea, then nobody's looking anywhere else. Nobody's looking at the areas where we have these secret underwater facilities set up, operating out of sight and mind. I could see the skeptical looks on some of their faces, but I continued. I know it sounds like a spy novel or a conspiracy theory. Trust me, I had the same reaction when I first heard about it. But I've been to these facilities, worked in them, explored the surrounding depths. I ran my fingers along the table's edge, feeling the cuts and flaws in the wood. What I'm about to tell you is not just a story, it's a warning, a look at another world that lies beside our own, below the surface of the ocean. I took another deep breath, preparing myself for the memories. It began with a standard mission, that's what they called it anyway, but when we dropped down into the black water of the trench, I could tell right away that this was something else, something was off. The room was quiet now, and I could sense the eyes of each person on me, waiting for me to go on. But I didn't. I was lost in my thoughts, back to that day, the day everything went wrong. I'm not the same man, I said quietly, more for my own benefit than theirs. What I experienced down there, I'm not even sure all the ways it affected me. I leaned back in the chair, feeling the memories of that day weigh heavily upon me, like the incredible pressure of the ocean depths. I closed my eyes and allowed myself to drift back to that day, that fateful day where everything went awry and my life forever altered. It was meant to be a simple demonstration, I said slowly, almost inaudibly. We were testing some new deep-sea exploration technology, seeing how far we could push the limits of our submersible, the Nautilus. It was a new design, built with the latest pressure-resistant materials and life support systems. I pictured the sub internally and grimaced. We executed a slow descent, and as we did, the darkness outside our viewports increased. The crew was in good spirits, joking and speculating on the discoveries we might make on this mission, but I... I just had this bad feeling, like there was something wrong, something... dangerous about where we were going, something that wasn't right. I gripped the edge of the table with white knuckles. We sank to our designated depth without any problems, and all systems were nominal, but then... Well, it's hard to explain. I blinked and met each of their gazes. The first thing was the lights. They dimmed for a moment, just a moment. But it set everyone on alert. Then the instruments began to malfunction. Our depth sensors were erratic. The sonar was reporting false returns, and we lost communication with the surface entirely. The room was deathly still, all of them leaning in, riveted to my tail. I was standing at the main viewport when it happened. It was an anomaly in the water, that's the best way I can describe it, like heat rising from a blacktop road, but we were thousands of feet underwater. The water above and around us seemed to warp and ripple, almost as if it were alive. I unconsciously shuddered. Then the pressure wave struck. It felt like the entire ocean above us had decided to take us in her hands and crush us. The hull protested, and the viewport before me began to spiderweb crack. I yelled at everyone to get to the emergency pods, but it was too late. Alarms were blaring, folks were screaming, equipment was tossed around the cabin as the sub pitched and rolled out of control. My throat was getting sore as I continued. 
I don't know how I managed to reach a pod. Everything was just motion and terror at that point. I remember the hissing sound of the seal as the pod closed around me and the violent lurching of the pod ejecting from the stricken Nautilus. And then, nothing. I took a shaky breath. I'm sure the ascent took hours, but I lost track of time. By the time I broke the surface, I was disoriented and half-conscious from the rapid decompression. The sun was setting and the sky was all orange and purple, and for a moment, I thought I was hallucinating when I saw them. I leaned in a little closer and lowered my voice. They just appeared. One moment, I was alone in my pod, just floating there in the water, and the next moment, I was surrounded. There were half a dozen divers, dressed in some sort of sleek black suits that looked like they were designed to absorb light. They moved very quietly and smoothly, barely causing any ripples in the water around them. The room seemed to grow tenser at his words, and I realized it was the same fear I'd felt then. Before I even had a chance to react, they'd grab me. The hatch of the pod was wrenched open, and hands like iron were pulling me out. I remember struggling, screaming for help, but then a mask was slapped over my face, and my lungs were filled with some gas. The next thing I remember is being dragged under the water, watching the surface recede as my vision faded. I shook myself awake, my head throbbing and my eyesight fuzzy. Gradually, the harsh fluorescent lights above came into focus as I tried to understand where I was. The last thing I could recall was those strange divers dragging me under the waves. Now, I found myself in what appeared to be a medical bay, lying on a cold metal examination table. As my senses returned, I noticed a low, steady hum that filled the environment. It wasn't the standard thrum of a ship's engine, but something lower, more visceral. I looked around at the sterile white walls, lacking windows and any sort of signage that might tell me where I was. I attempted to lift myself into a sitting position, but my limbs felt languid and unresponsive. That's when I spotted the IV inserted into my arm, the clear liquid running steadily from the bag into my veins, and panic began to blossom in my chest as I realized I was completely helpless, at the mercy of whoever had dragged me down here. The sound of a sliding door drew my attention, and I turned to see a tall woman with silver hair slicked back in a sharp bob walking into the room. Her gaze was as piercing as her haircut, and when she looked at me, I instinctively recoiled. "'Miss Scarlet,' she said, her tone crisp and clipped, "'allow me to welcome you to Abyss, Advanced Biosphere for Yield of Submerged Secrets. I am the director of this facility.' I tried to speak, but my mouth was too dry and my throat too raw. The director seemed to read my mind and raised a hand to quiet me. I'm sure you have questions. We'll address them when we can. But for now, understand that we need you here. Your unfortunate experience aboard the Nautilus has made you particularly well-suited to assist us with our work here. She pressed a button on a nearby console, and the examination table I was on began to rotate upright. As I was lifted to a seated position, I finally got a good look at the room beyond the one I was in. It was larger than I'd initially thought, and filled with medical equipment that I didn't recognize, as well as several large reinforced windows that overlooked nothing. Dark. The purest, thickest blackness imaginable. We were underwater, very deep underwater. How, how deep are we? I asked hoarsely. The director's lips twisted into what I think was meant to be a smile, though it never reached her eyes. Deeper than any civilian facility ever has been. Abyss is an area of unending darkness and crushing pressure, and this is where we perform our most delicate experiments. She waved for me to rise, and I did so unsteadily, following her out of the medical bay and into a long, arcing corridor. Even in my disoriented state, I was impressed by the engineering that had gone into this place. The walls were thick and heavily reinforced to survive the incredible pressure of the deep sea. We walked past a few more of them, labs with various unfamiliar instruments, what looked like personnel quarters that seemed surprisingly livable under the circumstances, and a large area that resembled some sort of hydroponic farm, all under artificial light. This is your accommodation, the director said, stopping in front of one. It slid open to another small but comfortably furnished space containing a bed, desk, and a compact kitchenette, as well as another reinforced window looking out into the darkness. All of your amenities are available. We'll provide you with your work roster soon. I walked into the room, still trying to wrap my mind around everything. What exactly do you need me to do? I asked, 
turning back to the director. I couldn't read her face. For the time being, just get used to your new home here. Tomorrow, we'll take you to a pressurized chamber and start to employ your specific skill set. The curved halls of the facility were all so second nature to me now. The ever-present sounds of machinery, the muted blue illumination from the bioluminescent lights, even the faint ringing in my ears from the constant lower atmosphere pressure. I'd come to accept all of it as comfortably as I did breathing. I stopped alongside one of the massive viewing ports and stared out into the endless dark. A few of the glowing sea life passed by in the darkness, and it was several moments later that I heard the voice behind me that I'd come to know so well. Still gazing at the scenery, Scarlet? I looked back to see Dr. Coral walking over, her reddish-brown curls loose from their typical messy bun. Her green eyes glowed with their usual kindness and inquisitiveness. Is it ever not? I asked with a grin. How was the surface? She sidled up next to me at the window, her tanned skin a vivid contrast to my white, Coral was one of the few people who got to make the occasional trip up to the surface, and the only reason she was allowed to do it so often was because she was our primary connection to the outside world. Bright, she laughed, and loud. I don't know how I ever got used to all that noise up there. We stood silently for a moment, each of us pondering our own memories. Coral had long ago transcended the role of mere colleague. She was my best friend, my sounding board, my only real connection to the outside world. Oh, she said suddenly, digging into her pouch. Almost forgot. I got you this. She dug a small waterproof tablet from her pack and passed it to me. The most recent marine biology journals, a couple of new novels, and some movies I thought you'd like. I accepted it with a quick smile, unable to hide my appreciation. These little links to the surface world were everything to me. Thank you, Coral, I said sincerely. You have no idea how much this means to me. She gave my arm a light squeeze. I believe I do. Come on, the director needs to see both of us in Lab 7. On the way to the lab, Coral brought me up to speed on the latest goings-on from the surface and any new scientific breakthroughs. Her excitement was charming, and I realized I was looking forward to hearing about these new discoveries in areas I'd never thought much about before my tenure down here. We reached Lab 7, a spacious area lined with holographic interfaces and intricate machinery. The director was already present, her silver hair shining under the stark lights. Ah, Dr. Coral, Miss Scarlet, she said, as crisp and formal as always. I'd like your thoughts on a new project we're considering. She waved a hand, and a holographic image of what appeared to be an underwater turbine system appeared. We're looking at ways to utilize the deep ocean currents for sustainable energy. Miss Scarlet, I thought your background in deep sea pressure dynamics might be useful to us here. I examined the hologram my brain already spinning with ideas and potential problems. What will this do to the local ecosystems, I asked, highlighting a few problematic areas with my finger. The director smiled and nodded. Exactly. That's why we need your input. Dr. Coral, I'd like you to partner with Miss Scarlet on this one. I think your expertise together will be instrumental in determining whether this project is feasible. I listened with growing satisfaction as the director explained the project. I had started out as a reluctant prisoner, and now I was a consultant in this bizarre underwater outpost. They actually wanted my opinion. When the meeting was over and Coral and I were leaving the lab, she elbowed me gently. Look at you, saving the planet one underwater turbine at a time. I chuckled. It's nice to feel like we're making a difference, I said. You always have been, Coral said quietly, from the moment you arrived. I didn't have time to ponder her cryptic words as I followed Miss Scarlet through the twisting halls of the facility, my heart racing. We went through a handful of security barriers, each one requiring more clearance than the previous, until we arrived at a large, reinforced door labeled Restricted Area Authorized Personnel Only. Miss Scarlet laid her hand on a biometric scanner, and the door slid open with a hiss, exposing a poorly lit room beyond. We stepped inside, and I gasped quietly. The room was massive, and the walls were lined with enormous tanks filled with water of various colors and viscosities. This is our main containment area, Miss Scarlet said, her voice reverberating in the high space. Here we store some of our more exceptional specimens. We walked to the nearest tank, and I leaned closer to look, my eyes widening in shock. Suspended in the murky fluid was what appeared to be a humanoid figure, 
its skin shimmering with an unnatural blue illumination. Its limbs were disproportionately long and moved with a disconcerting fluidity, and I could see its large, almond-shaped eyes blinking and tracking us. This is what we refer to as a luminous one, Miss Scarlet said. We discovered it in a sub-oceanic trench. Its bioluminescence is unlike any we've observed before. I focused on the creature as its glow pulsed again. Is it intelligent? I asked. Miss Scarlet frowned. We're not certain. It appears to have some means of communicating via light patterns, but we haven't been able to decipher it yet. The next tank held another creature that I could only describe as an enormous cephalopod. Its tentacles moved languidly, and its eyes, each as large as a dinner plate, tracked us with disturbing focus. Don't stare at this one too long, Miss Scarlet cautioned. He's known to have some hypnotic effects. We've lost a few researchers to him over the years, just getting a bit too lost in his gaze. I hastily looked away, noticing an odd tugging at the corners of my awareness as I did so. We passed several more tanks on our way, each containing increasingly alien specimens. One was a fish that appeared to be constantly changing its shape, its body moving like molten mercury. In another tank, I spied a group of what looked like living crystals, their surfaces glowing from within and resonating a deep, mournful hum. As we approached the last of the specimens, I couldn't help but ask, Miss Scarlet, with all these amazing specimens, I would have thought there would be some documentation of other than terrestrial life. Her face didn't change, but I thought I detected a bit of tightness in her response when she said, We only concern ourselves with terrestrial aquatic life here, Miss Scarlet. The ocean is vast and deep and full of enough surprises to keep us busy. I nodded, only half listening, as I reached the observation dome. It was late, well past midnight, by the digital clock on the wall, and sleep eluded me. My brain was still churning with the questions that had arisen during my tour of the containment facilities earlier in the day. When I stepped into the dome, I was a little surprised to find Dr. Coral already there, her shape marked against the endless black of the deep sea beyond the arched panes. She heard me come in and turned, her face lighting with a friendly grin. "'Couldn't sleep either?' she asked, waving me over to join her. I nodded my head in the negative as I walked over and stood next to her. "'Not really, just too much information, I think.' We both stood silently for a moment, staring out into the dark void before us. A few moments later, I saw a bioluminescent organism float by, a brief glimmer in the never-ending darkness. "'It's amazing,' Dr. Coral said." and we've only explored a tiny fraction of it. I thought of the odd life forms we had seen in the containment area and nodded. Do you think, I asked cautiously, there could be more than just exotic life forms here? I mean, what if there were civilizations? Dr. Coral faced me, her green eyes bright with curiosity. You mean like advanced underwater civilizations? It's certainly possible. The ocean encompasses more than 70% of the surface of our world, and we've only mapped about 5% of it. It's entirely possible there are entire cities buried in the depths. I nodded. And if they do exist, what do you think their attitude towards surface dwellers would be? Would they be inquisitive about us, or would they try to avoid us? Dr. Coral's face grew more solemn. That's the key question, isn't it? If these civilizations exist, they've certainly managed to keep themselves under the radar very effectively. Perhaps they see us as a threat, considering how we've polluted and destroyed so much of the ocean. Or perhaps they're just not interested in anything that happens above the waves. She regarded me for a long moment. You know, Miss Scarlet, you've always had a different take on things than most people. I sometimes wonder if there's more to your history than you let on. My heart began to race. Had I been too obvious in my line of questioning? What do you mean? I asked, trying to keep my voice even. Dr. Coral's eyes were sharp. I've known many of the scientists and researchers that have come through here over the years, but none like you. The things you've observed, the intuitions you have about the abyssal depths, it's almost as if you've been there before. I frowned, considering my words carefully. Dr. Coral had been nothing but friendly and trustworthy since I'd come to abyss. If there was anyone I could open up to, it was her. I took a breath. You're right, Dr. Coral. There is more to it. The truth is, I'm not from any country you'd find on a map. I'm from an underwater civilization that's existed beside humanity for centuries, without your knowledge. 
I followed Dr. Coral as she led me through the darkened hallways of the facility, my heart pounding in my chest. We moved quickly and quietly, stopping periodically at intersections to listen for any guards or security cameras. We don't have much time, Dr. Coral said urgently, shaking her head widthwise as she glanced around a corner. The shift changes in 20 minutes. We need to be gone by then. I nodded, doing my best to control my breathing. Where are we going? Wear this, she said, passing me a black wetsuit. It's a deep-sea pressure suit. It'll protect you all the way down if necessary. While I changed, Dr. Coral continued to pack supplies, filling a waterproof duffel with rations, a first aid kit, and what appeared to be a high-tech communication device of some sort. This is a long-range underwater communicator, she said, seeing my look of interest. Quantum entanglement. You won't be able to be detected or traced, but only use it if you have to. Once I had finished suiting up, Dr. Coral escorted me over to a small panel on the rear wall of the room. She retrieved a pen-like device and aimed it at the panel. There was a high-pitched whine, and the lights on the panel extinguished. Sonic disruptor, she explained, with a tight-lipped smile. It'll disable the security systems for around ten minutes. Hopefully, that's long enough to get you to the docking bay. At last, we arrived at another large pair of doors labeled Submersible Docking Bay. Dr. Coral applied the sonic disruptor once more, and they parted with a hissing sound of hydraulic pressure release. The interior was a wide open space, lined with different types of underwater craft. Dr. Coral guided me over to one that was streamlined and looked to be very compact, a one-man submersible, if I had to guess. This is your sub, she said, assisting me into the open cockpit. It's the fastest and most agile we have. Hopefully, that will be enough to get you away from here before they notice you're missing. I took a seat, and she handed me a small data drive. This has the coordinates for a safe house. A friend of mine, Mr. Green, resides on a secluded island. He'll be able to help you stay hidden until it's safe to travel again. She shook her head vehemently. You didn't ask. I'm deciding this. What they're doing here, it's not right. You should be free. Should be able to return home. At that moment, an alarm began to sound throughout the facility. Dr. Coral's eyes flicked wide. They found the security breach. You have to go now. She hurriedly pointed out the controls for the sub and stepped back as the cockpit began to close, pressing her hand against the glass just before it sealed. The submersible descended into the blackness of the deep ocean, leaving the facility lights in our wake. I steeled my grip on the controls and my racing heart as I maxed out the engines. The vessel hummed and vibrated around me as we sliced through the water at an unnerving speed. For the next few minutes, I attempted to distance myself from abyss as best I could. The darkness surrounding us was complete, save for the occasional bioluminescent flash of some deep sea creature. Then, a quick series of sharp pings sounded in the cockpit. I looked at the radar and felt my heart drop. Several signals were moving towards my current position. They were submersibles and some sort of aquatic drones. No, 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 I said aloud, changing my direction frantically as I saw them coming. I dove between some of the underwater rock formations, trying to use the terrain to my advantage and shake them off. The pursuit went on for what seemed like hours. Several times, I thought I'd lost them, only to hear the ping again, closer. My hands were slick with sweat inside the suit, and I was starting to tire. Finally, just when I was starting to despair, I heard a familiar voice through the communication system. Miss Scarlet, are you there? It was Dr. Coral. Coral, yes, I'm here, I said, feeling a rush of relief. Listen to me very carefully, she said, suddenly more animated. You have to halt the submersible immediately. I paused, looking at the radar. The other boats were almost upon me. But they're already behind me, I protested. Listen to me, Coral said firmly. There's a current coming up just ahead. If you enter it at too steep of an angle, it'll rip the sub to pieces. Shut down now, and I can navigate you through it. I took a deep breath and throttled back the engines. The submersible coasted to a halt, and I felt the hull begin to rotate with the water movement. Good, Coral said. Okay, listen to me very carefully. When I say so, you're going to throttle the engines up to full power and turn hard to port. The river will take care of the rest. I waited, my body a coiled spring, as I watched the radar pings become louder and more numerous. Now, Coral barked. I threw the throttle forward and yanked the controls hard left, the submersible angling abruptly and for a heart-stopping instant. I feared we would overturn, 
but then I felt it. The enormous wave of water that struck the craft and threw us ahead at breakneck speed. Hang on, Coral shouted, her voice lost to the thunder of water and the protest of straining metal. The sub spun and tumbled in the grip of the current, warning lights blinking across the control panel as I gritted my teeth and struggled to keep from losing consciousness, G-forces hammering me back into my seat. Finally, after what felt like a lifetime, the violent shaking began to lessen. The current had released me, and I was floating in still, dark water. Miss Scarlet, are you okay? Coral's voice was anxious. I... I think so, I said, still shaken. What about the others? The ones that scattered them, she said. You should be okay for now, but you need to keep moving. Head to the coordinates I provided. I nodded, even though she couldn't see me. Coral, thank you. For everything. There was a long moment of silence, and when she replied, her voice was strained. You're welcome. I just... I wish I could do more. Come on, I said her urgently. It's not too late. You know I can't, she replied gently. We need someone here to ensure they don't start coming after you again, and there's still more to do here. I blinked back tears. I'll find a way to return for you, I swear it. Don't, Coral interrupted. Don't throw away everything we fought for. Just live, Miss Scarlet. Live and be free. Miss Scarlet, she said, you need to go, now, and don't look back. You remember the currents I taught you about? Trust your instincts. Miss Coral? The submersible moved silently through the dark depths, its form barely disturbing the currents around it. I had been flying for days now, following Dr. Coral's instructions and the coordinates she had provided. My path had led me through a series of underwater canyons, more dangerous each one. I kept a tight grip on the controls, eyes straining ahead into the blackness. The lights of the vessel illuminated the rocky seabed and chaotic currents ahead of me, and I could see movement on the radar every few hours, distant echoes that could be either pursuing ships or large aquatic fauna. I didn't intend to stick around to find out. As I passed through a particularly tight spot, the submersible tilted suddenly to one side, an alert flashing on the panel before me, indicating a stabilizer failure. I wrestled with the controls, heart pounding as I steered between the massive underwater monoliths, Come on, I urged the submersible, just a little further. The stabilizer had failed completely just then, and the vessel had begun to spin, throwing me into a momentary panic as my sense of direction was lost. I'd cut the engines and let the current take me while I scrambled to reroute power to the backup systems, and it had taken me several minutes of tense work to regain control. When I'd finally done it, I'd breathed a sigh of relief, realizing how narrowly I'd escaped disaster. When I'd reoriented myself, I'd noticed the change in the water around me. The current was stronger here, tugging the submersible with greater authority. Trust your instincts, Dr. Coral had said. I had a feeling this was the current she'd spoken of, the one that would carry me to safety. I engaged the engines at their lowest setting, just enough to keep me on course within the flow. Several hours later, I allowed the currents to carry me along. The seabed passed away from me, and I found myself moving through open ocean, catching fleeting glimpses of massive schools of fish and the darker shapes of larger predators beyond. As the first light of dawn began to filter down through the water above me, I noticed that the water around me was also growing lighter in hue. I checked my depth and saw that I was climbing quite a bit faster than before. My heart quickened in my chest. Was this it? Had I reached my target? Without warning, the submersible broke the surface of the water. I blinked rapidly as my eyes from days of darkness adjusted to the sudden change in light, and when my vision finally cleared, I was greeted with the sight of a lush green island rising from the crystal waters. I steered the craft into a small, concealed cove on the eastern shore of the island. As I neared the beach, I spotted a lone figure standing amidst the surf, a middle-aged man with deeply tanned skin and a scruffy salt-and-pepper beard. He waved a hand at me as I brought the submersible into the shallows. Shaking the hatch open, I clambered out with as much grace as I could muster. The hot, humid air enveloped me, and I took a deep, long breath, relishing the familiar smells of salt and lush greenery. My legs threatened to give out after days of sitting in the cramped cockpit, and I stumbled more than once as I splashed through the shallow water and towards the beach. The man on the sand hurried to intercept me, his hands firm and steady, as he grabbed my arms and helped me up out of the water and onto solid ground. Welcome, 
he said. His voice was gruff, but not unkind. You're the one Coral sent down here to me. I'm green. I nodded, still a bit in shock from my abrupt journey from the underground depths to this tropical oasis. Thank you for helping me. Mr. Green's stormy gray eyes appraised me for a moment before he nodded. All right, then. Come on, he said, motioning to a trail that disappeared into the thick jungles ahead. We'll get you to safety. You need some rest. As we walked, I took one last look at the submersible floating in the cove. It had brought me to freedom, but what would it bring to the good doctor? I thought of Dr. Coral, still back at the facility, and could only hope she was all right. I spent the next few days settling into island life, thankful for the unassuming hospitality of Mr. Green. The sun-kissed sands and vibrant jungle were a welcome change from the sterile confines of the facility I'd fled. Still, in every moment of peace, my thoughts drifted to Dr. Coral and the fear for her well-being. One morning, I found Mr. Green on the beach, gazing out over the water with a pensive look. When he heard my footsteps, he turned to me with a serious face. Trouble at the facility, he said. Dr. Coral. My heart sank. What's happened? Is she okay? Mr. Green took a deep, weary breath. They're calling it a diving accident, but he didn't need to finish. But what? I asked, more sharply than I'd intended. She's gone, he said after a long pause. Nobody spotted her since the day after you got out. I felt my face go pale. No, I said quietly. That doesn't make sense. She was supposed to stay behind and cover my escape, but... I know, Mr. Green said softly, but that's why I don't think it was an accident at all. The facility director has been unusually silent on the subject, from what I hear. I grated my teeth, frustration and guilt fighting for dominance in my chest. We need to do something. We need to get in there and get her out. Mr. Green sighed and put a gnarled hand on my shoulder. I know you're upset, but we have to be smart about this. If we just charge in there, we could endanger both you and Coral even more. I breathed in deeply, stealing myself. I know, but I can't just stay here and ignore it. You won't have to, he said. We'll tackle this together, but for now, I think the best way we can proceed is to tell Coral's story. We need to honor her courage by ensuring that people understand the reality of what's going on at that facility. I nodded slowly, my thoughts whirling. Yes, they need to understand what she gave her life for, what she was up against. We spent the remainder of the day discussing our plans for safely spreading the word, and as the sun began to set and bathe the island in a golden hue, I found myself back on the beach, staring out at the endless ocean. I was on the beach, watching the ocean swell gently kiss the sandy shore as the day's orange and pink sunset gave way to night. It had been a few days since Mr. Green had first come to me with the news of Dr. Coral's unfortunate accident, and I was still struggling to wrap my head around it all. Lost in my thoughts and staring at the distant horizon, I heard the quiet approach of footsteps behind me and turned to see Miss Scarlet making her way along the beach towards me her face set in a determined but uneasy look. Isla, we need to talk, she said, her tone hushed. I nodded and waved her over. We strolled along the shoreline for a moment in silence before she continued. I've reached out to my people, Miss Scarlet said, never looking away from the flat expanse of the sea. They're coming. I had to suppress a gasp. Your people? You mean... She nodded. Yes, my underwater civilization, the one that Dr. Coral always theorized. I felt a mix of exhilaration, skepticism, and a little fear. How long have you known about them? Why haven't you told us before now? Miss Scarlet shook her head, spreading her hands. It's complicated. I couldn't afford to expose them until I knew it was safe. But now, with Dr. Coral missing and the facility still active, we don't have a choice. We had reached the end of the hallway, and she turned to me, locking her gaze onto mine. I could have sworn I saw a faint glow within her irises as she continued. There's something else, she said, lowering her voice to a conspiratorial whisper. The place you escaped from, the one in the Bermuda Triangle, that's not the Abyss facility, not the original anyway. I think my jaw just hit the floor. What? Abyss, she said. It's a decoy, a facade to prevent anyone from uncovering the real Abyss, which is buried in the Pacific Ocean below us. I struggled to wrap my mind around this. But why? What's the point of all this? The mood on Mrs. Scarlet's face darkened. They want control. 
power. The organizations behind Abyss have been researching our society for decades, looking for ways to exploit our technology and knowledge for their own purposes. The base you were at was only one of many. I shook my head, still trying to wrap my mind around what she was saying. And this Dr. Coral, do you think she knew all this? Perhaps, Miss Scarlet said sadly. That's why we have to move quickly. My associates will be here shortly, and with them, we can bring the truth about Abyss to light and hopefully locate Dr. Coral as well. At that moment, I noticed a commotion in the water far offshore. At first, I dismissed it as just a large swell, but as it approached, I began to see sleek, otherworldly shapes moving just below the surface. Miss Scarlet's hand is on my arm, her grip surprisingly cool. You sure about this? She asks, looking deep into my eyes. Once we take this step, there's no turning back. The world you know will be different from here on out. I inhaled deeply, thinking of Dr. Coral, her unwavering conviction that there was so much more out there that we didn't understand, her lust for knowledge and discovery, her bravery in the face of the unknown. I thought of what lay beneath the surface of the ocean and what might happen if we brought it to light. I watched the sunset from the beach, barefoot in the warm sand, as the fiery globe sank into the horizon. The sky was a riot of orange and pink, mirrored in muted colors upon the serene ocean. As the day gave way to night, I pondered all the events that had brought me here. The doctor's fervent convictions about the existence of some advanced civilization of underwater beings coexisting with humanity had once seemed nothing more than the pipe dreams of an overzealous academic. Now, looking out over the water, I could see how astutely she had perceived the truth. The rhythmic sound of the waves washing over the sand was joined by a distant flicking sound, and I turned to see Miss Scarlet breaking the surface, her body shimmering as she moved. I could now see the faint glimmer of what looked like scales along her arms and legs, obscured by the dim light of early night. It's time, she said, and I noticed for the first time how musical her voice was. I nodded, my heart pounding with excitement and a little fear. I can't believe it all, I said. All the things Dr. Coral theorized about, they're all real. Miss Scarlet smiled, and I caught the glint of the fading sun in her eyes. Dr. Coral was an exceptional woman, she said. Her instincts and knowledge of the ocean were formidable. She understood our world better than many of my people, I think. I felt a small twinge of sorrow at the thought of Dr. Coral. Do you think we'll find her? I hope so, Miss Scarlet said, her face losing some of its hardness. My people are already looking. If she's still out there, we'll spare no effort to get her back. We stood quietly for a moment, watching the first few stars appear in the indigo sky. At last, Miss Scarlet turned to me, her eyes fierce. You realize what's about to happen, right? She said. Once we expose ourselves to the world, there's no turning back. The equilibrium between our two civilizations will be changed irrevocably. I breathed deeply, weighing her words. I understand, I replied, but isn't that what Dr. Coral wanted, for our worlds to intertwine, to share knowledge? Miss Scarlet nodded, something like approval in her gaze. She did, and that's why we're following her wishes, but I need you to grasp this. She hesitated, lowering her voice to just above a murmur. What you've seen so far... What you believe you know about us? It's only the beginning. I felt a chill along my spine, even with the warmth of the evening air. What do you mean? Our civilization is much more advanced, more complex than anything you can conceive, she said. The technology we possess, our social structures, our understanding of the universe, it will all turn your perceptions of reality on its head. I swallowed again, struggling to understand. Is that why Abyss was interested in you, because of your advanced knowledge? Miss Scarlet's face grew solemn. Somewhat, but there are things at play here that Abyss isn't even aware of. Things that could change the world entirely. She faced the ocean again, staring out into the distance. That's why we need to be so careful with this information. The pact I made with Dr. Coral. To disclose the truth to the surface world. It's not merely an issue of curiosity or scientific progress. It's about ensuring humanity is ready for what's coming. I felt a tickle of unease in my spine, despite the warm evening air. What's coming? Miss Scarlet shook her head. 
I don't know, but things are going to change, and sooner than anyone thinks. Your world needs to be prepared for it. Miss Scarlet reached out and took my hand, her grip cool and slightly moist, a reminder of what she really was. Thank you, she said quietly, for all that you've done and all that you will do. She released my hand and took another step backwards into the water. I need to return to the depths now, she said. My kin are expecting me, and there is much to be done. As she began to turn and wade out into the surf, she called back to me one last time. Just know, she said, her voice loud against the roar of the waves, that what you're about to see is only the beginning. Stay focused and have faith in the vision that Dr. Coral shared with us. The reality is far more glorious and more horrifying than anyone believed possible. With that, she plunged underwater, her body just briefly glowing before she faded away into the inky depths. I remained on the shore, staring at the place where she had disappeared, still processing what she had said.